Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. When Jesus came as the Messiah, He had to establish who He was and confirm it through fulfillment of the long-awaited prophecies that God had been giving to His people since time began. Today we're turning to Matthew chapter 1, and today we're beginning our study of the New Testament. And if you've been listening to all these podcasts for this whole time, thank you so much for being part of this. I hope that this has been as rich a time for you as it has been for me, as we've been going through God's Word and just seeing all that God has to say to us and finally coming now to the beginning of the New Testament. Now, as we turn to the New Testament, there are some things I think we need to go over. One of the things we need to understand is just what this word testament means. Remember, the word testament means covenant. And what we're going to be reading now are the documents of the New Covenant. We have just completed our study of the documents of the Old Covenant, which has taught us, going all the way back to Genesis 3.15, that God will send a Savior, that this Savior will come from the line of Abraham or the tribe of Judah, that he'll be a direct descendant of King David, and he will dwell upon an eternal throne. He will establish his covenant in righteousness and holiness, and he will be with his people forever. Now, that's the Old Covenant, and the New Covenant documents build upon the Old Covenant documents, and the New Covenant documents teach us about the arrival of the king and the kind of kingdom he has established and how we are to live as his kingdom citizens and the kind of kingdom we are to look forward to in the future. And so, as we read all of these passages, we need to remember that these documents unpack the covenant that God has made with us and that we've made with him, that he would be our God and that we would be his people. And when he returns to establish his kingdom, he will give his covenant people a place within it. And so the new covenant documents begin with the gospel of Matthew. And we're going to be spending the next week and a half or so unpacking this key book. So who was Matthew? Now, you might already know this, but Matthew was a former tax collector. And in that day, being a tax collector was tantamount to being a traitor to his own people. Matthew would have worked for the Roman occupiers, and his job was basically to fleece the Jews out of their money and give that money to the Romans. But then, Matthew meets Jesus, and his entire life changes. He went from serving the Roman Empire to serving the kingdom of God and its king. And then, not long after the death and resurrection of Jesus, Matthew wrote this account of the life of Christ. Now, if you're familiar with the New Testament, especially the Gospels, then you may have already noticed that the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke are all very similar. They're often called the synoptic Gospels. And the word synoptic means syn as an S-Y-N meaning together and optic seeing things together. It's this idea of seeing everything from the same perspective. And so these Gospels are so similar that sometimes people say that, well, the writers must have just copied off of each other because there are times that the words are identical. But I don't think that's the case at all. Just think about it for a moment. Imagine what it would be like to be a follower of Jesus back in those days, like an actual follower, one of the 12 disciples. You would know that Jesus is the messianic king. You would know that you have a solemn responsibility to be a herald of this king, to announce his instructions to all the people throughout the region. I believe that Jesus' followers knew this and they took their role very seriously. And so as Jesus taught, they would write down his words and then send those teachings throughout the region. It's kind of like press releases, almost like today when you have people at a conference and they're just kind of recording what's being said and posting it to Twitter, or or maybe they're going just traveling around the world and just writing this blog or this travel log of, of their journeys. And so with that kind of understanding, as Jesus taught, his followers would record what he said and then send out those messages, kind of like leaflets or status updates of what the king was teaching and what he was doing. And so these little announcements were effectively like little mini gospels that were declaring that the king had come and what he was teaching and that all the people had to prepare for his arrival. Now, you can imagine the villages receiving these records and reading them in the synagogues and and many people taking these messages to heart and beginning to live by the instructions of the king. And as more and more of these flyers were coming on in, these communities would be keeping them and gathering them and reading them and living by them. And then after the death and the resurrection of Jesus, Matthew, who again, he could read and write because he was a tax collector, he would gather up all these records, basically the, the originals to what was being sent out to everyone else. He would gather them together and compile them into one long account of the life of Christ. Later on, the other gospel writers would do the same. And that's why Matthew, Mark, and Luke are so similar. And yet it's also why they're so different. And it's also why they're called gospels and not biographies. A biography is a strict record of a person's life. A gospel is biographical in nature, but it's written for the purpose of announcing and proving and verifying the arrival of the king. And so I believe that Matthew was the first to compile these records together into a single scroll, and that makes sense because Matthew was an eyewitness to many of these events. 
And so being the first to pull all of this together, Matthew's gospel is heavy on the message of Christ as king and his fulfillment of these divine prophecies. Now, all of this is background to Matthew's gospel. Now let's dive into chapter 1. Chapter 1 opens with this genealogical account of the ancestry of the Messiah. It begins with Abraham in verse 2, and it works through the generations down to the birth of Christ in verse 16. Now, there are several things I'd like to just point out about this list here. For one thing, this list is not simply just a list of names. This is a profound record of the history of God's work among the Jewish people. For a Jewish person who's reading this list, most of these names, specifically the names in the first two sections of this genealogy, these were people who represented major events within the history of the Jews. For instance, just in verse 2, the mere mention of Abraham just would bring to mind God's covenant with Abraham all the way back in Genesis 12, where God had promised Abraham that he would be the father of multitudes of people, that they would have their own land, and that through them, through their seed, all the nations would be blessed. And Galatians 3.16 tells us that seed is specifically speaking of Jesus. Going back to verse 2, Isaac, of course, was Abraham's miracle son, born in Genesis 21, when Abraham was 100 years old. Uh, Jacob was Isaac's son, and Jacob's name was later changed to Israel, and he had his 12 sons who more or less became the 12 tribes of Israel. And so here we are only two verses into Matthew's gospel, and we're reminded of God's promises and his work among his people. And if we were just to go through this list, we would remember so much of Israel's history that we've been reading about for the last eight months. For instance, Judah in verse 3 reminds us of God's prophecies that through him would come Israel's kings. Boaz, the name Boaz in verse 5 would remind us of the principle of God's loving gift of redemption. Rahab would remind us of God's faithfulness to his people as they entered the promised land. In verse 6, David is mentioned as Israel's kings. Now, David's a big deal. And in 2 Samuel 7, we saw the Lord promise to David that one of his descendants would sit upon the throne forever. And so all of this is going on here, and all these names just instantly remind the people of these events. And going on to verse 7, Solomon then comes after David, and after Solomon comes Rehoboam, and under Rehoboam's reign, the nation of Israel divides into two nations or two kingdoms, the northern kingdom called Israel, the southern kingdom called Judah, and we discussed all of that in great detail in our podcast in 1 Kings 12, and really all the other podcasts in the books of Kings and Chronicles that came after that, because all that divided kingdom just really caused all kinds of problems for the people of God. This time of divided kingdom was largely a time of disobedience and failure of God's people to keep their covenant with him. And so there are some good names in this list, but for the most part, this list highlights the failure of God's people to keep their covenant with him. Now, as we go through this whole list, we need to remember an important data point from Judah's history that just might seem obscure, but it's really not. And it's right here in this passage. Notice the name in verse 11, Jeconiah. Notice that name Jeconiah there in verse 11. If you've been just keeping up with us here and listening to this podcast for a while, then that name, Jeconiah, is going to be familiar to you. And Jeconiah was also known as King Jehoiakim, or as well as Kaniah, but we're just going to call him Jeconiah because that's what he's called here in verse 11. And so Jeconiah was so angering to the Lord that in Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 30, the Lord declared that none of Jeconiah's descendants would ever sit on the throne of David. Now, if you pause and think about this, well, that might seem to create a problem here in this lineage of Jesus, because after all, this whole passage is proving that Jesus was a descendant of King David, going all the way back to Abraham, and it goes right through the lineage of Jeconiah. And how can that be? Because the Old Testament tells us Jeconiah is going to have no descendant who sits on the throne of David. So this might seem like a huge problem, but it's actually solved in verse 16. If you look at verse 16, it says, Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who was called the Messiah. Now, notice what verse 16 doesn't say. It doesn't say that Joseph was the father of Jesus. That phrase, father of, occurs over and over again throughout this whole lineage, going from verses 2 to verse 15. But suddenly it stops here in verse 16, and it doesn't say that Joseph was the father of Jesus. Well, why not? Well, because Joseph was Mary's husband, but he's not the father of Jesus. In fact, verse 18 tells us he was conceived of by the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is the son of God. He's not the son of Joseph. And yet, Joseph did raise Jesus as his own son, and therefore Jesus had all the rights of Joseph, and all those rights were passed on to Jesus as if Jesus was the true son of Joseph. Jesus was legally an heir to the throne of David, even though biologically speaking, he was not related to it through the lineage of Joseph back through Jeconiah to Solomon to David. But that then still raises a problem because God had promised to David back in 2 Samuel 7 that one of his descendants would take an eternal throne. 
And if Jesus was not really related to Joseph, it would seem as though that prophecy didn't really come true. And that's where Mary comes in. Turning your Bibles over to Luke chapter 3, verse 23. I'll give you a minute to turn there. You can pause the podcast if you need to. Luke chapter 3, verse 23. Uh, this verse says, When he began his ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Eli. Now notice that word supposed. That's telling us that Jesus was not truly related to Joseph. But notice who Joseph's father is said to be in verse 23. It's said to be Eli. Now what gives? Matthew said that Joseph's father was a guy named Jacob, and here Luke is telling us Joseph's father's name Eli. Is this a mistake? No. Luke's genealogy is actually through Mary. And back then, when a wife would marry a man, her rights and privileges were transferred to her husband. And so Mary's father's name was Eli, and Luke's genealogy is actually through the lineage of Mary. And this is key, because notice where this lineage passes through when it gets to David in verse 31. It passes through David's son, Nathan. And so Jesus is actually related to David by blood through Nathan, and he's related to David officially through David's son Solomon to Jeconiah down through Joseph to Jesus. So just an incredible just working of God through these prophecies here as we just see this unfold in the life of Jesus. Now let's go back to Matthew chapter 1, and let's look at verse 17, because we've got still some more to go here. Verse 17 says that there are 14 generations from Abraham to David and from David to the deportation, from the deportation to the Messiah. Now, this also might seem to present a small problem because at first glance, the generations don't add up to 14, 14, and 14. And it's also clear if we compare these to the accounts of the kings that Matthew has omitted various names in this genealogy. But this really isn't that big of a deal. As for the 14 generations, if you number them starting from Abraham going up to David and then restart your numbering at David, you get three divisions of 14. It's pretty easy to figure that one on out. In regards to any omitted names, that was just a common way of handling genealogical records back then. We even see this in the Old Testament and various other places. The purpose of genealogies was not to record an exact history of families. These weren't like census records or something that was going to be posted on Ancestry.com one day. These were lists that established things like authority and ownership and, and, and family relationships. And so in a world where scribes and scrolls were hard to come by and where they had to memorize most of their records, lists were abbreviated when necessary, and that's what's going on here. And so then what is Matthew's point in giving us this list of generations here? Well, first, this is just to remind the people the downward trajectory of Israel's history. And he's given us these three eras here. The first era was from Abraham to David, and the people of God were led by the patriarchs. And oftentimes you read those accounts, it's like, yeah, there's an awful lot of stuff that's not great in those records. The second era from David to the deportation, the people of God were led by kings. And these kings were not leading people under the authority of God, but their own authority and just leading the people astray. And the third era was from the time of the deportation to the time of Christ, and where the people of God were pretty much being ruled by Gentiles. A couple of godly leaders would rise up here and there. But for the most part, this was just a, a really just discouraging time because there was really no national identity, no Davidic king any longer. And it just showed the need to usher in the final king, the true king, the anointed Messiah. And so this list shows us, first of all, the need for the Messiah. And then secondly, and even most importantly, that Jesus has fulfilled these prophecies. He has every right to the throne of David. And he has arrived as the complete fulfillment of all these prophecies. There's no one else. If somebody came on the scene today and said, hey, I'm actually the Messiah, there would be no way to prove that that person has fulfilled all these prophecies that, that avoid Jeconiah, that, that still gets back to the line of David, back to Abraham, back to Adam. No one else can prove that. Only Jesus can. And here we see that Jesus truly is the king that God has been prophesying all along. Now, that's all of the genealogies of Jesus, and it's taken us really most of this podcast to get through this list. But I do want to say a couple words about verses 18 to 25. I'll try to be quick here. This just gives us a very familiar record of the earthly life of Jesus. Um, this is a passage that is read in pretty much every church, pretty much every Christmas holiday. And so as we look at this passage here, uh, just a couple things to point out. First, verse 18 tells us that Jesus was conceived of by the Holy Spirit. Now, we're going to be talking about this more as we go throughout the rest of the New Testament. But here is just key to understand the nature of Christ, that he was and still is the Son of God. 
Likewise, he is also God in the flesh. If you look at verse 23, where Matthew explains how all of this fulfills the prophecy, that if you look in your side references, Isaiah 7, 14, where the Messiah would be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, indeed, Jesus was and is God who is with us. And what's cool to see here is the first time the word God or theos occurs in the New Testament, it refers to Jesus and his divinity. Going on, verse 21 points to the reason why Jesus had to come. He came to save people from their sins. Now, our study throughout the whole Old Testament and now as we go into the New Testament, it has shown us the utter failure of mankind to establish a righteous world and a righteous society that when we follow man's ways, things get really haywire really quick. And so if we want true righteousness, it must be under the lordship and the rule of Jesus and in his kingdom. And so we need to be saved from our sins, both individually as those who have sinned against God as well as a society as a whole, we need to be saved because this world is under God's judgment because we've been rebelling against him. So we need to just lay down our rebellion and repent and come to him and be saved from our sins and the judgment we deserve. And so Jesus came to save us. And as we unpack the gospel accounts of his life, as we unpack the New Testament, we'll see just how he accomplished that. Well, that's Matthew chapter one. This has been a longer podcast, so we'll just simply leave it right there. We'll catch you tomorrow as you turn to Matthew chapter two. Hope you have a great rest of your day. 